Welcome back to the show, everyone. We, uh, we have another special guest. He's a stud in the industry, and I just wanted to introduce him real quick. We have Chad Mareshi. Uh, we've had his brother on once before, Chris. You guys all know him. If you haven't, uh, definitely another guru of the industry. But Chad is the CEO of Natural Organic Resources. Did I say that right? Maybe I messed up. Natural Organic yeah, Resources Pest Control. Natural Resources Organic Pest Control. Yeah, that's awesome. So I didn't mess it up. Rolls right off the tongue. It's, it, but it's not, it wasn't even in the intro, but we just added that. So cool. Um, but yeah, he's the CEO there and you have a lot of really cool things, which I just found out one of them, I think is super awesome that we'll get into throughout the show uh, that everyone can learn from. Uh, you guys do a lot of organic pest control, like your name says, and we just added that in there. So I didn't know that before. So I'd love to hit on that because like I told you in the pre-show that you know a lot of the a lot of the states are kind of going that way, pushing more organic. I know Canada is all that way. So maybe you can learn a lot from me about that. But first, um, let's say welcome to the show, Chad. Thanks. Happy to be here. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty excited to have you too. And why don't you just start off and just kind of tell us, like, I know your dad started this back in the day, like what year he started uh, and then when you came along, how you got in industry and things like that. Um, yeah, so... In 86, my dad and my mom founded the company. My dad went back to school when he was in his mid-30s to study pest control technology and entomology. He finished his degrees in about a year and a half. Um, so he went to night school while he was working his day job. And they started the business in 86. And my dad pretty much did everything. He was doing fumigation. He was doing LNO. He was doing GHP. And my mom ran the books, did a lot of cold calling. I remember being really little. I mean, I was born in 89, so they started before I was even born. But when I was really little, um, my mom, my aunts would be sitting in the dining room with the white pages and the yellow pages, those big, thick books. And they were just cold calling businesses just to try to get the business going. So, I mean, that's how they started. And technology back then in terms of pest control was kind of non-existent. So they ran everything off index cards and with a phone, word of mouth. And it was pretty much, so my, my dad was doing it for a little bit until they hired their first part-time technician, Curly, who's still with us. He's the OG. He's awesome. Still holding it down. And then my dad went on to get a job at the city of Bay Harbor Islands because we needed health insurance and other things. So both my parents had day jobs. When my mom would get home from work, she would hit the phones and do all the scheduling. And Curly was running his part-time route and my dad would do some stuff on weekends and in evenings. And that was it. I mean, I think the most revenue they brought in the whole time they were doing uh, pest control was probably like 75k. So the business was really designed to supplement the family's income. My brother and I were both going into private school. My parents also had a couple of rental properties. So they worked really hard. They were really frugal. They were really smart with their money. They invested in a little bit of real estate to get that rental income, their business income, and the income from the jobs that they had, their day jobs. So that's kind of how it started. So when you were coming up, did you be like, did you work with them? Did you say, hey, when I grow up, I want to do this with them? What was that like? I would ride with my dad all the time and it was fun because he, it was cool to hang out with him in the fields and learn, learn about stuff, bugs and plants and things. He was always a really good educator in the field and really helpful. He would go above and beyond with all of his customers. Like if he saw that a doorknob was loose, he'd say, Chad, go to the truck, grab my screwdriver, let's fix this. You know, he was very much like that, you know, with, would do a lot of extra stuff. So I kind of learned that from him also. You know, I, I did that myself when I was in the field. You know, if I saw an opportunity to make a quick fix or lend a hand to a customer, you know, I learned that from my dad. Um, but yeah, I mean, I watched both my parents work really hard my whole life and that instilled a really strong work ethic in both my brother and I. I mean, you met my brother, he's, he's an animal. He's on a whole nother level than I am, but um, yeah, I went to college. I didn't think I was going to be involved in the pest control company at all. I, I, ideally, like initially, I didn't want anything to do with it, kind of like my brother did, but we both ended up finding our way back into it. So I, I went to school. Um, I, in high school, I wanted to be a dentist for some reason. I always liked going to the dentist. I never, I never, it never bothered me. And I, I kind of wanted to specialize in pediatric orthodontics because I loved kids. And I had this vision for a really cool kid friendly office. 
But as I you know, was going through my collegiate career, I hated the library. And, you know, although I was like, a, I was a pretty good student and most of schooling came easy to me. But once I had to spend hours and hours in the library, I, I kind of, you know, I just it wasn't for me. It was taking a lot of energy for me. And um, I knew that I was going to have to make a shift. So I took all of my my science credits that I had accumulated and transferred them into a secondary biology education major, because then I decided maybe I'll be a teacher because I still wanted to be involved with kids. I was coaching volleyball at the time. I was driving back to Miami from Boca to coach at a high school that just started a volleyball team. And I really loved that. And as I was going through the education degree, we had to teach at various public schools around the college to gain credits for, you know, actually being in a classroom. And that's when I was private, private school kid my whole life. So that was my first experience in the public school system. And it was, it was kind of disheartening, you know, it was, you know, the teachers couldn't wait to get out of their positions to work in an administrative position. And all the teachers seemed kind of burnt out and there was a lot of administrative stuff. And, you know, I kind of, at that point, it was in like my fourth year, I was like, man, now I don't really want to do this. What do I do? And that's when my brother had started his route and he built the website for the company. He was starting to like level the business up, you know, bring it into the current day. And he was like, you know, business is doing well. Why don't you know, you come help me. If you don't come help me, I'm going to have to hire someone. I was like, that was a no brainer for me. Like I dropped whatever I was doing to go help my brother. Uh, my parents were, you know, not really into it as much, but they were keeping their part-time technician going for that income. Um, but they weren't really trying to grow it or do anything else with it. So when my brother jumped in is when it really started, you know, to do well. And, and shortly after that, he went on his journey to develop Gorilla Desk. So at that point I was, you know, he had, had left the business to me at that point. And then my mom had gotten sick and she was running the office. So you know, while she was going, she had lung cancer. She's okay now. She's good. She's uh, really healthy now. But um, that was really rough. So for that whole year, um, I had a GM and I had hired an admin because I knew that I didn't have time for the admin. I had to be in the field all day. And Patty, who's my GM, longtime friend of the family, was helping take my mom back and forth to her doctor's appointment. So she wasn't really in the office as much as I needed. So I, I hired an admin. Alyssa, who was amazing, um, kind of threw her into the trenches. We didn't have a lot of processes, systems, like she was kind of figuring it all out as she went and when, with the assistance of Patty, kind of when she had her and I was in the field every day, 10, 12 hours a day until, you know, I was able to grow out of that, you know, hire another tech. And then I was moving offices and kind of went from there. Cool. So when you, when you left school and you came to join the company, business said you're probably doing about 75,000 revenue. It's all on paper, all on Rolodex. Your brother launches his website, bringing it back up into modern day. You, when you came in, was it still on paper or was that when maybe, what did that look like when you first started? That's when we were using um, a desktop based platform. My brother mentioned it in the video. I forget what it was called. Um, but I remember one time we had a hurricane and we didn't have power internet or anything like that and we didn't have access to the database and fortunately my um patty and my mom you know developed a super old school method of printing every single invoice and stapling them all together to the customer so we did have a paper trail thank god but um yeah this, it was like a not user-friendly so then chris goes off and starts developing gd right mm -hmm. And I'm sure he tested it on you before anyone. So you were like, you got to see it like early, early on. Yeah. I mean, everything he does, I test and he, he's, we're always bouncing ideas back and forth, which I think is really cool. And, um, yeah, it was, he started it really pretty much just in Photoshop. He wireframed how he envisioned it to look with all the buttons in place. And when you click this, you know, go to the next image of what he wanted it to look like until he found a developer to start making the buttons work and we started to get, you know, a workable version. And he just went from there and he's been doing that since I think we, we, we adopted gorilla desk. I want to say like 11 years ago, maybe 12. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Started using it from there. 
But you, you said something that kind of like peaked up my ears. You said that he's light years ahead of you in a different level than you are, but there's nothing wrong with that. And like, you guys probably have different visions of what you want your life, what you want it to look like your life. Right. So he's an entrepreneur going crazy, doing big things. And you're like, well, that's not really who I am. There's nothing wrong with that. I just want to have a really good life and live a lifestyle business. Yeah. But without a software, like a gorilla desk, right. You can't have that lifestyle because you're just stuck in the mud all the time. You're trying to figure it out on paper, like your Rolodex, like it just, it's way too, way too time consuming to go from pa on paper. So for all the listeners that maybe are still using paper, don't have a CRM that should jump on Gorilla Desk, but uh, walk us through like that. Like obviously you're doing everything all at once and I kind of pulled away from the business a little bit, but you guys have built a lifestyle for yourself. I'm sure your parents will live a good lifestyle. I remember Chris mentioned to me that they might still have a few homes. I remember right yeah so they live next door to me um th i'm living in the house that they rented out for a really long time and behind them we had a really big florida room that they had converted when i was really little to a studio 500 square feet where my office is currently and i have two admin come in a couple times a week they work remotely most of the time i just hired another remote admin so the office is really i mean a place for us to gather for meetings and where i keep dry storage um, but essentially I could, I could run this business fully remote if I wanted to. And Gorilla Desk gives you the ability to do that because everything's online. Everything's in one place. He just, uh, he just released the voice over IP feature a few months ago. So now we have our phones connected in there. It automates communication. It's just, it automates so much of the administrative work. And now that the voice over IP is in there, there's also smart views. So we have different lists that we can use for our outbound sales, follow-up processes. It just makes everything so clean and organized. You can set tasks, reminders, create opportunities for sales teams. You know, it's, it's just, and it's getting better and better constantly. I mean, my brother, my brother has the next three years of development mapped out and I don't see him stopping because he just really loves it. He's having a lot of fun with it. For sure. And how much has that improved your business though? Oh, a ton a ton in my quality of life because you know one of our core values is make it easy and that was one of those things that just made a lot easy it made a lot of my text lives easier you know they run their whole day on the phone they wake up they see their route if they need to stop by and pick up chem or whatever they do that but for the most part everyone's working independently and it but also together right we have a discord channel and there's three different channels there's one for just me and the admin one for the whole team one for just the tech. So like not one channel gets too flooded with information that isn't pertinent to any particular, you know, um, group of people. So it's, it's super, it's running really smooth right now. Like, um, it, and now it's just a matter of making everything better constantly. You know, you came in and did you like, was your goal to like, Hey, I want to get my parents out of here. Did, like I want to retire my parents or what was the goal when you came in, Chad? Initially, it was to help my brother. I was, I've always assumed the role of support kind of in the family, I think. Um, wherever I can help, I want to go help. That's where I get the most gratification, where I get a lot of my energy and my happiness is, is helping, making things easier for other people, making things better. So initially, when my brother asked me, it was like, no problem. Yeah, I'm there. You know, I'll help you. So when, when he went on to, to start Gorilla Desk, my mom had then gotten sick. And so my focus was really just keep bringing the money and keep the business running. When she got better and I was able to kind of relax and refocus, I, I then had to ask myself, what am I want to do? Like, what do I want to make of this? And initially it was like, you know, when you talk to people in the, in the industry, it's, it's a lot of, you know, how big do you want to get? Or how big are you going to get? How many techs are you, are you going to franchise? That's, it's always that's like- That's the first question, right? Like how many techs do you get? What's your revenue? Yeah, it's always a, like very grandiose kind of big. And I felt kind of the pressure, not only from my peers, but from the industry. They're like, man, I really need to blow this up. Here I have this really cool business. We're in a neat niche. We're in a great city. Like, why don't I open an office here, here, and here and get, you know, 10 trucks at each one and all that. And then as I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, I kind of, I don't want, I don't want to go through all of that, you know, just being in the business my whole life, I learned a lot about, you know, how complicated it can be and how easy it can be. And it all depends on what, what you impose on yourself, like how, how you want to make it. And once I, once that light bulb went off that I could be as creative as I wanted and I could 
I could put myself into this business and have it be more of a reflection of me as opposed to just carrying on what the family had built and, you know, what everyone was kind of expecting. It wasn't until then I, I found my identity and then was able to start making my own choices, implementing my own ideas and processes and really making it my own. Yeah. And I, I really love that. I didn't know anything about business, running the business. You know, I knew the business. I knew how to be a tech and, you know, yeah, I think Emith has been mentioned on every single one of your podcasts, but I did read that book <laughs> and it was like, yeah. okay, cool. This, this makes sense, right? Like I can adapt. I can change my identity in the business from technician to, okay, now I'm an owner, right? And now what do I want this business to look like? How do I want this business to serve me and my family and my employees? And once I had that clear vision, I just kind of went after that and tried to build that the best I could. And I love that you said that. Yeah, I joined an organization called Entrepreneur's Organization that my brother pulled me into. He joined it also. And I surrounded myself with other, you know, entrepreneurial people. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about business. And it was also cool to be able to have people to talk to about business because not all my friends own businesses. Most of them work nine to five, so they couldn't really provide support. You know, I could vent to them and they would give you all the generic responses, but they can't really help you. They can't really like, you know, help you make go, make your mind up about things. So being an EO was really cool. Um, I dropped out of that around COVID time because it was getting kind of weird with like all the Zoom stuff and it just didn't have the same feel. I really like that a lot. And in EO, they teach you um, EOS. So I was using reading traction and scaling up and I implemented that in my business to an extent. You know, I don't follow it by the book, but I got my ideas from it and I implemented what I felt would work for me. And that's that's kind of where my where my, you know, educational journey in this business went. Most of it came from that, learning from other people. Yeah, and there's a few things that you said that I really loved. One, you said, I want to make this business work for me. You're not going to work for the business. You're creating a lifestyle. And the other one was like, okay, you're, you know what you wanted. You're going to go create this lifestyle. And people get so caught up in revenue. And then people have different dreams. And there's nothing wrong with going after multi-unit, you know, $10 million, like you said. And there's nothing wrong with having a lifestyle business doing 800 1.8 million doing crazy amounts of EBITDA. Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters is your EBITDA. At the end of the day, that's what it makes your family life better, your employees' life better. You're like, stressed out all the time. Like, I, I had to learn the hard way too, Chad. Like, I remember I was like pushing it to go like 1.2 million early on in my first business. And I like felt like I was flat broke all the time, like stressed out all the time. It's like, okay, it doesn't have to be that way. Right. And I had to learn the hard way too. So I love that you said that. The people who are listening that are doing, you know, five to 800 to a million and you're making three, four hundred thousand dollars in cash, you don't need to grow. Sit right there. It's a sweet you know, spot. No, there's nothing wrong. It yeah, is a sweet spot. You have no overhead. Spot. And revenue doesn't matter. Revenue doesn't really tell you the story of the business and if it's healthy or if it's profitable or if you're, you know, if it's, if you're able to pay your people well or if they're getting the benefits and stuff that they need. I mean, Revenue, it's cool to have like a, as a target or a goal or whatever, but what really matters at the end of the day is how, how healthy is your company profit-wise? Like, are you making money at the end of the day? Are, are all your people paid really well? Are you giving them the benefits that they need and want? Do they have the time off vacation policy in place that works for them? How are they motivated, you know, and are you leaning into what motivates them to keep them? Because when you're making lifestyle business, one of the biggest pains is churning employees. So I, I rely on these, on my team, right? I, I need my team. And so they kind of come first, you know, and as long as they're happy and, and they want to stay, then I can continue living the life that I want to live, continue providing for them, continue providing for the family. Yeah. And, it, and if you don't have cash in the bank, you can't go buy new equipment. They're using raggedy old trucks, raggedy old equipment. They're frustrated. Like when you have money in the bank, it's easy to go buy them a new B and G or whatever. We have all new stuff all the time. I have, 10 flow zones sitting in the shed because at the end of the year, you know, it's time to write off some money. So what do we do? Let's get, get more of the equipment that we like, get more parts. You know, all my trucks look really good at the end of every year. I take them to a body shop, get all the dents and scratches out. We redo the emblems. And it's simple things like that. But if you're chasing revenue, right. And you don't have the money in the bank, it's not, you can't do those small little things. So 
I love that you said that because people get hung up in that all the time. Like, again, like you said, you're like, you're getting a lot of pressure from maybe podcasts or from, from other entrepreneurs that are wanting to do big things. And at the end of the day, you, it's super cliche, right? Like to figure out what you want and your why, but at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And if you're making a good living, we know that four techs, you know, about 800,000 to a million, you don't need a manager making good profit margins, probably 300 some thousand a year. Like, I love that spot in the, in the industry. It's such a great spot to be in. My brother, my brother just said something to me recently too. Like every now and then he says, he reads a ton of books, right? He reads, I don't know if you've seen his library, but it is absolutely insane. He's got sticky notes and everything. So, you know, he's not just flipping through, like, you know, he's reading stuff, but he said something to me the other day, you know, you just you need to stop worrying about what other people think. I get kind of emotional because it's something I really struggle with for a long time because I'm such a people pleaser. And even like my own family, like I worry about what they think. Like I want them to be proud of me. I want them to be happy. I want them to be comfortable. But one of the biggest hangups for me when I got to the point that I wanted to get to forever, having the time that I wanted, the freedom that I wanted, I felt this like really heavy guilt, you know, and it was like, you know, I could wake up one morning and not touch the business at all, do literally whatever I want. Everything's going to run fine and everyone's happy and it's all working. But the, I, I found myself not really being able to enjoy it or settle in that happiness because of the guilt of like, you know, I, I can having the freedom, the freedom gave me guilt, which was like a weird thing to think about. But, you know, I've, I've been at this for, man, it's 2024. I'm 35. I, I think I jumped in around 22. So about 12, 13 years. And so I worked really, really hard, you know, went through all the stuff with the family, my brother doing his thing, my mom getting sick, figuring out how to hire, learning about everything to get to the point where I am now, where it's like, you know, the business doesn't really need me so much. I'm still here, you know, like, and, and the business gives me energy in a way that like, I love seeing it running really smoothly. I love looking in the chat, seeing my team members communicate, solve problems together. But one of the things, I mean, it's still sometimes that I, I deal with the guilt of having the freedom, which was the goal, which was my vision this whole time. And I feel like that's just the, it's just the me thing, you know, but it also stemmed from worrying about what other people were thinking. Like, yeah. So I had this, I went through the same thing too. I reached out to my mentor. He goes, you know what, Jonas? So what's that? He goes, that means you built it the right way. And I was like, ding, light bulb went off. Like, awesome. And the same thing with me, like, I don't have to go into the office every day, even though I just, I'll stop in and say hi, call everyone, check in, have a leadership meeting once a week. And I'm always busy doing something, work with my sales team, marketing, whatever, you know? So, but again, like pat yourself on the back because you built it the right way. That's how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, no, I feel great about it. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful and it's really the team, right? The team is, is the pinnacle of it all and keeping them happy and healthy and you know, providing for them is what keeps this engine going. And as long as this is going, you know, and I have my time, I can then focus it on whatever I want. And it could be another business. If I want to start another business, it could be a hobby. It could be just, you know, spending more time with my family or supporting my brother when he needs me, you know, so it's good. You know, I've, I've been coming to terms, I've been accepting it more and I'm feeling better about it. You know, I don't want, I don't like disappointing people, but um, no, the business is great, you know, so Awesome. So when you, when you first got into the company, were you guys doing all organic then, or was that a switch that happened later on? It was a switch that happened later on, but my dad, my dad grew up, sp grew up spending summers in the Everglades. And he always had an affinity for nature. So even when he was an applicator back in the OG days with like Durs band mouth ion and stuff, like he would find opportunities to treat lawn pests with soap if he could, instead of, or an organophosphate or something like that. So he was always pretty mindful, you know, and he still kind of practiced IPM to an extent sometimes. It wasn't even on anyone's radar back then, but he was like, no, we only need to treat this. We don't need to hurt anything over there. You know, like, let's just take care of this. So that was always kind of in my philosophy. But when my brother jumped in, you know, he saw an opportunity to really lean into the natural part of our branding, which we didn't we weren't really natural in the eighties and, and nineties. But that was your name still at the time? It was still natural? It was Natural Resources Pest Control Turf and Landscaping Services Inc. So that That's was the short. name. Yeah, that was my that was, you know. <laughs> so now we're DBA as Natural Resources Organic Pest Control. 
And we're definitely leaning full force into that. And thankfully, the industry is catching up in terms of you know what products are available for us to use. Lot 25B stuff. You know, companies are are playing with different types of bacteria and fungus, which is neat. You know, changing them how how boric acid is used, putting it in baits instead of just having it as a dust and stuff. So. The industry is seeing it. The industry is catching up. But when my brother decided to really lean into that, you know, 12, 13 years ago, we were buying glass jars of essential oils and mixing them with droppers in our sprayers to come up with soap and peppermint based solutions. And, you know, we were kind of toying with that stuff before, like the eco vias and the essentias and all that kind of stuff came out. And we were doing that for a while. You know, I was getting peppermint. I was smelled like peppermint every day for, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, you know, like it was on me. Worse. It was on me all the time. Yeah. I, I remember smelling like three way every time I came home, a herbicide. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my brother, my, bro- and then we were using the pyrethroids, which, you know, at the time were kind of new to the market, you know, a flower based chemical and you can kind of pitch it that way or whatever. So it wasn't until maybe like the last six years, my whole, um, lineup is practically 25 feet. I mean, we do use some conventional things for other issues, but for the most part, we're using a Centria and Entice for our GHP work. So, I mean, that's pretty clean. Did you have to change up your service level at all? I've changed everything so many times. So yeah, I mean, COVID gave me an opportunity. We were doing indoor outdoor for every service and the majority of our revenue came from monthly. So we were doing monthly indoor outdoor. It was a huge pain scheduling because people had to be home. And when COVID hit, you know, I wanted to implement doing perimeter only, interior as needed. And it opened the door for me. And the transition was like absolutely perfect. So it seized the opportunity. Yep. And I dumped monthly, went to bi monthly and quarterly, changed our pricing to make sure that we were covered for any callbacks. So, you know, we're, we don't lose money on anything now. Whereas before we kind of did and, and we weren't running efficiently at all. You know, my guys were super busy, but we weren't making a ton of money, but we were busy doing a bunch of monthly work. And during the rainy season, when it rains here, three o'clock every day or earlier, you know, but yeah. And and it undoes all the work you did all day. So it was, it was kind of a nightmare. So by switching to bi-monthly and quarterly, I freed up 30 to 40% of our schedule. And then I was able to work on efficient, like route efficiency, make that even tighter. And then I gave my guys a a lot more bandwidth to to bring in more work. So, you know, from there was really when things changed for the better. So with, uh, with, uh, with your organic products, you went from doing monthly to actually bi-monthly, which I thought it was going to go the opposite. I thought you were going to say, yeah, we were doing quarterly, but we went to bi-monthly and then we went to monthly because the products just weren't holding up long enough. That, that's my initial thought. And you're like, no, actually, we were doing monthly and we went to, to go bi monthly and then the quarterly. So the products are good enough to uh, last 90 days, or are you getting more callbacks because you're not using, quote unquote, the better products? You know, really, if you're able to take care of the customer's issue on the, that initial visit, if they're calling for ants or roaches or whatever, and you, you can take care of it and you do a really good job there, you know, they, they don't really need you that often. You know, I only spray my house maybe three or four times a year. And that's, it's kind of, you know, their seasonality. Like once the rainy season starts ant roach stuff picks up, a lot of mosquito stuff picks up. That's probably where we get more, more of the callbacks on the mosquito because we'll do a bunch of misting all day and then it'll rain, but we do the same day rain guarantee. So that's not an issue. Really what helped was uh, adapting my pricing to account for those callbacks so that even though if we had to do a callback, that quarterly price was so nice that if we had to go in between, we're still making money. And when we do go back for a callback, we're only spot treating. So the business doesn't take, doesn't take that long. You know, we had to come in and treat for ghost ants in the kitchen or whatever. Our guy goes in there, follows the trail, leaves his bait, you know, and pretty much good to go. What does your mosquito look like? Is that monthly, 21 days, monthly, quarter? What do you guys do there? It's a lot of monthly because we use Intacare and those need to be serviced every month. Okay, cool. So you're just using the little red, the little black and red Intacare traps? Yeah, those buckets. Um, we, we bury them and um, those are serviced monthly. So 
they we only offer them to customers who purchase misting so because those caches are so expensive i decided for my pricing model what i wanted to do was i'll sell misting but if you want a more robust treatment we will also add insecure traps for 25 bucks a pop and it's a nice bump you know it, it increased that profit for that service and it takes no time at all and then we also apply granular bti so we use three products, three different modes of action. We're one of the only companies down here that are doing it that way for some reason, which I don't understand. But um, yeah, it's it's sweet. Our guys go missed, and then when they're doing their traps, they take a spreader and they spread BTI in places that stay wet, you know, soggy soil, plants that hold water, bromeliad, stuff like that. And we get pretty good control, you know. That's really cool. So in your misters, what are you guys using there? I know a lot of people like up this way is a garlic thing. I haven't messed with the garlic stuff. I kind of want to catch messers had like a garlic bait for a while and then they discontinued it because they were having manufacturing trouble. I think and they couldn't, you know, get the supply out, but we use Ecovia MT and for like really, really bad, um, mosquito pressure, or there are certain areas in Miami that are very lush and jungly, like coral gables. We, we could use like a Tau star P if they want something more conventional. Uh, where that persists so long, but really the, the, the magic in the recipe is using all three of those together, you know, doing the misting, we don't tart, we don't spray any flowering plants, just like how anyone shouldn't with that. But, you know, we focus on shady areas, the structure, fence line, underneath furniture, and so we strategically place the into care traps and we spray our BTI and we do that every month. And obviously if the, if the N2 traps weren't working, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be using them. Have they reduced your callbacks quite a bit? Um, they've always kind of been low for that. Really the only callbacks are after rain. And sometimes you have customers that, you know, we, we do a pretty good job of setting expectation, like what customers are going to feel, you know, it's not going to be hundred percent. We're in South Florida and most of the single family properties here are small. So, you know, we can do everything we can on your property, but if your neighbor has got a backyard full of bromeliads, you know, it's going to be tough. So we're pretty frank and we do a good job at looking on Google maps, you know, we'll do an aerial view and, you know, we'll say like, Hey, you know, you're right up next to a canal or brackish water. One issue down here is no seams. That's a huge problem. So they're really hard to treat and they breed in the muck. So we get a lot of calls for those and I just turn them away because there isn't really anything you can do. Same. So we're on the Great Lakes here. So it's really wet around here. And we, we get there. I was just on a three mile run this morning everywhere. There's nothing we can do. We have a bunch of cottages on lakes, things like that. And there's nothing we can do about them. I was hoping you were going to say like, yeah, we, we control them, but no, we can't either. That was another thing I did too when I took the business over is I looked at our service offering and I was like, you know, what do I want to do? What do I don't want to do? I hated all the rodent stuff. I hated the exclusion stuff. I didn't really like dealing with termite because the market down here is so saturated and, you know, the, the prices have been whittled down to, you know, fumigation companies are making, you know, five to maybe 10% on a fume job. They really make their money on, you know, the, on the annual warranties that they sell. And then they come in, they'll spot treat, but like, that doesn't really work, especially if you've got swarmers and stuff. So I kind of stayed away from that. I'm actually going to get back into it just to sell bait stations as monitoring devices and maybe do some spot treating for like, if there's termites in a door jam or a window frame, that's easy, right? But if they've been in your attic or underneath your house and swarming and all that kind of stuff, you really got to fumigate at that point. But yeah. And as far as like the, or like going all, all organic, you say you're marketing your name, all that stuff. Uh, do you think you can drive your prices up higher because you're different? Yeah, and I did. Absolutely. I, I love it. We are a more premium company too. I mean, our customer service is awesome, right? My my office staff is amazing. They're really responsive. They really try to help. And customer experience is another one of our core values. So, you know, every you do get customers that are really difficult and hard to please, right? So identifying who your core customer is is really helpful. That helped me a lot, you know, and every now and then we review our customers and, you know, we ask ourselves, are there any trouble customers, any people that are problematic, anyone that, you know, is giving us grief all the time. There are some people that you just can't make happy. Right. And so those are the ones that we, you know, tend to part with because I try to keep, I try to keep the experience 
for my staff with customers really good too. You know, if someone's ever rude to one of my staff members, you know, uses profanity, is yelling, disrespectful, you're out. Like I have a zero, zero tolerance policy for that kind of stuff. And the staff loves that. And I have their back on that and they know it, you know? And so what we're really, really, really good about is documenting absolutely everything. If someone's rude on the phone, even during like an initial call, or has a tone that is uncomfortable, you know, it's made, like they make note of it. Now that we have the VoIP in there, all the calls are recorded so I can go in and listen. But anytime my employees have an experience like that, they bring it to my attention, you know, and we have information. I review the information, I listen to the calls, and then I decide, you know, is this someone that, you know, I want to do business with or not? Because if, if someone's really rude to one of my staff members on the phone, right, like one of my admin, and that's on their account, right? Customer was rude on the phone or whatever. My technician goes, my technician is now going to be kind of weary, you know, like, okay, this customer was rude to Nelly on the phone. Let's see how they are with me. If they're rude with them too, they report that. And it's like, okay, you're out. And if, and if you have a, a negative experience with a customer and they're a regular customer and you have to go back to see them every month or every other month, that's not a good feeling, right? When you open up your schedule in the morning, you see that one name on there and like already you're like not looking forward to the day to getting through the day and i don't like that feeling so i didn't like it as a technician and so i wanted to make sure that that didn't happen to my techs either you know i wanted them to go look at their schedule and say piece of cake every day like okay cool i got this 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 and this it's going to be sweet and then you know all my guys are are home by five they start their day at nine most of them have kids and families and stuff so and they, do they come to the shop often or they work right from home, just fill up at home and head out? Yeah, they'll fill up their water at home. They'll come here for product, but they keep, we, I've, I'm on like version five of how I've organized my truck. So they can keep a good amount of material on their trucks and they take their trucks home. So I don't really see them too often. You know, they'll come by here and when, when they stop by, I'll go out there and, you know, chat with them for a bit. But like I said, for the most part, everyone's working really independently. Yeah, I love the angle that you guys took with the organic thing. I think it's super smart. You guys are marketing yourselves different. It's a whole different uh, audience that you're that you're marketing to. Uh, I, I really love it. I think you guys done a fantastic and job. And it's really easy. There's no reason why every company, you know, doesn't have some sort of green model because everyone's using IPM now. That's been a thing forever. And all you have to do is use IPM with you know the 25B stuff in a way that works. Right. And if you're if you're doing your job well and you're thorough and you're paying attention to the details and you're being meticulous, it will work, you know, and then the result is you're using less toxic, toxic stuff. You can charge more. The customers feel better. The technicians feel better. I had thyroid cancer. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in 2017. I had my thyroid removed. I have a cool little scar here, but. You know, I went to a few functional medicine doctors and it was all because of the accumulation of heavy metals and all this, you know, organophosphates and stuff I was exposed to as a kid. You know, when I would ride with my dad, we would be spreading fertilizer, spraying mouth islanders ban. You know, PPE was like, use it if you want, but do you guys still do L and O or are you just strictly past now? We do L and O, yeah. We I mean that's where that's the stuff I like the most because I like plants and insects and you know i like teaching people about you know what plants attract what bugs on their property and you know there's a huge movement down here where i am now where people are trying to install more native like landscapes and attract more pollinators and butterflies and things like that so they are more they they want to be careful you know well a question we get all the time is will it hurt bees or butterflies you know are the pollinators going to be okay you know, that's one of the main reasons people use us aside from the health stuff. But yeah, people don't want to be exposed to toxic chemicals anymore or their kids or their dogs, you know, people's pets get cancer. And if you're doing L and O and you're spraying all sorts of stuff and the dog's going out there and rolling around in the grass, like, you know, that stuff's going to accumulate in your animal over time and they could get sick. I agree with you. What is, what do you, what has been the biggest challenge they've had to overcome since you've been Started 12 years ago in the business. Probably assuming the assuming the role of like the owner. Like calling yourself the CEO was like hard. Yeah, it went from, you know, I was ready to work under my brother forever. 
You know, I was like, if he wants to take this thing over and blow it up, I'm going to be right there. And he went on to Gorilla Desk, which is awesome. I love that. But then I was, I kind of was left without an identity. You know, I left, I left school, not really wanting to do pest control, but wanting to help the family. So you almost had a little bit of an imposter syndrome for a minute. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, there were, there were moments where I was like, I don't want to do this. Let's sell it so I can figure out something else. You know, I would have like these panic moments. I was like, I don't know, like, what is going to make me happy? I didn't feel happy a lot. And it wasn't until I realized that I get to be, I get to create whatever I want here. You know, I have a business that is started, which is an amazing opportunity. And now I can transform it into whatever I want. And that was probably the biggest hurdle for me. Like, you know, how do I want to grow this business? You know, what, what services do I even want to offer and what do I want my life to look like in 10, 20, 30 years? It's super awesome. Cause that's one of my next questions <laughs> is, uh, is, is literally that, what, what, what does your life look like in the next five years? What's Chad going to be doing? What's the business going to be doing too? You know, I want to, I'll keep this business for as long as it's running like it is because it's really great. You know, it's running really smooth. It requires minimal energy on my part. My team is really happy. They really like working here. My customers are really happy. So I have no reason to, you know, get rid of the business and start something else. So I, I see myself keeping this for a really long time and just being patient and growing slow. I, I mean, there could be some acquisitions in the future of some other smaller companies because there are a lot of those here. There are a lot of solo guys that are getting old and wanting to retire. And if they don't have anyone to pass it on to, then, you know, they end up just selling their customer list and then that's it. Unfortunately, you know, the, the multiple for small companies is pretty small. I think I, I, think I read a stat that 10,000 um, people retire a day. I think is that the stat that I heard? In this industry? In this industry, well, and not in this industry, but in business in general, uh, there's 10,000 business owners. They um, retire every day, single day. So think of all those opportunities. In fact, we're closing on a business here in uh, 25 minutes. Oh, congrats. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so they're, they're out there, you know, and we found them right in our backyard. So it worked out pretty good. And I try to, I try to reach out to those people and create like relationships with them. You know, we, we help each other. Like Gene, for example, from Mega B, like Gene was over at the house the other day and, and, you know, he's second gen too, went his own way. His dad's still doing his thing, but he's also one of those people. That it's like, okay, I have this business now. I'm, I'm not formally educated on business and all that kind of stuff. He's figuring it out on his own. He's young. He's got energy. He's a stud. I love Gene. Yeah, I try to help him where I can. And, you know, he helps me too. He's helping me get my termite license. I used to have a card under my dad's license, but we let that expire because I wasn't doing it or whatever. So, you know, it's cool. Like, there's so much work down here. I don't feel threatened by any of my competition. I live in a bowl anyway. Like, I don't pay attention to what's going on out there. I just pay attention to my team, my numbers, my customers. So, you know, who who really knows, um, like, way down the line? But, you know, probably I, I see myself doing this for a while. I may start trying to dabble into some real estate, but since I've been in pest control, I've been using all of my money to fix up the properties that my parents have. They're getting older, so they can't really deal with contractors. You know, they don't have the patience. They've dealt with tenants forever. They just, they're, they're tired. Do they still live in Miami too? They live next door. Do they have a couple houses? Yep. The one I'm in and theirs. And then the one next door to me and my dad built in the 90s, around like 93, I guess, when Hurricane Andrew hit. They sold that, um, I think, in, I want to say... I don't know, a while ago. Um, but they sold that, paid off a bunch of debt. So now they just have the two houses. My brother has his place in Boca. But I've been using most of the money that I've been generating from pest control to fix these two properties up because eventually my brother and I will be, you know, responsible for them. And I want to make sure that they're low maintenance when that time comes. So all new plumbing, electric, windows and doors, roofs, um, new septic tanks. I, I just put a pool in the back. It's literally being filled up for the first time right now. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. I'm working on getting the backyard squared away because my parents like to sit back there and have their coffee. My mom loves butterflies, so I'm going to put a nice butterfly garden back there. And it will be a space for the family to just enjoy and make memories. You know, my brother comes down for the holidays. He spends the night for a few nights. Do you pick his brain while he's there? I mean, 
sometimes he's he usually shares stuff all the time with me like if there's something profound or cool like he shares with with me all the time we're really close really growing up we weren't because we're eight years apart so it wasn't really until he you know graduated college that we started really becoming closer um but yeah man my brother's awesome we have a really great relationship now so yeah my part of part of growing this business and creating it the way I have was to give me the means to do the things around here that I've been doing, you know, improve the quality of life for my parents and myself here and really help my brother not have to worry about taking care of my parents so much too. You know, he's, he helps also, but he's also very busy. And because I have the time and energy and funds to do the things around here, you know, I do them and, you know, I'm sure that brings him peace also, you know, that Chad's down there, he's taking care of mom and dad, he can really focus and put a lot of his energy into his business. Cool. I have one last question before you wrap up. Go for it. What are you most proud of? I'm probably most proud of just my family, right? Like my parents didn't have a lot growing up and they worked really hard for a really long time and they gave us the opportunity, our opportunities to, to kind of get us to where we are now. Like had my parents not started that pest control company, Gorilla Desk would not exist. My brother would have never probably found that path. And I, I would have never gone down the path I'm on either. So I'm, I'm most proud of, you know, my parents, my brother, like he's such an impressive person, you know, and I look up to him a lot and he's doing great things and will continue to do great things. And I'm just really proud of my family. We're a really good team. And I don't know. The future's going to be really interesting, you know? My, I love it. So, yeah. I'm so cool. Awesome. Well, again, I told you to keep it about an hour. So, I'm sticking true to my word. But thank you for your time. I appreciate you, Chad. I appreciate what you're doing for the industry. I think it's super cool. And I think a lot of people are going to probably start following this model, especially after hearing this. It definitely piques my interest. Like, okay, maybe we should start adapting a little bit before uh for most of the other ones do you know like I, like I told you before i know canada all has to do it this way so i think it's smart yeah i hope your viewers like this content and if any of them are interested in learning more about what i do specifically feel free to reach out to me i'm on facebook i told you i'll be there in a couple of months i'm gonna come visit your shop and come do a tour and go see your brother and go to hang out with gene for a few days get some content it's gonna be a good time bring your bathing suit catch a little tan we'll do. <laughs> awesome Cool, man. Well, again, thanks for your time. I appreciate you. Cool. Take care, man. Thanks. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of Pest Control Millionaire. We don't charge any money for the show, obviously, but the podcast isn't free. You can pay for the podcast by sharing it with your friends and your family. So please like and subscribe and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. These things make a huge difference for us. If you have any specific questions you want answered about the business or your life by me or my guests, send an email to info at pestcontrolmillionaire.com. And if you want to get in touch with me about any personal business coaching, check out our website at www.pestcontrolmillionaire.com. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you guys again on the next one.